said nearly every time, but we truly give God thanks for being in this house. So I just say, be welcomed. And I greet you all in the mighty name of Jesus. Special greetings to our Reverend James and all the ministers of the house, and visitors and children. Um, it's been a while since I've spoken. And um, it's, it's always good, you know, especially looking at this year's theme, which is the year of faith, isn't it? And um, faith is something strongly that we as believers need to adhere to and have deeply. You know, um, there's times when our faith is tested, but then how do we overcome or how do we get through if it's not existent? Um, I'm going to share two passages of scripture. I'm going to read, so bear with me in time. It's, um, the first one is from Job's 1. And we're going to read the whole of that chapter. And then Job 2, verses 6 to 10. Okay, so that's Job chapter 1, right through. And then chapter 2, verses 6 to 10. I'll read. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all, the people of, the, of all the people of the east, sorry. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and curse God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? The Lord said that, you know, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all he, that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and, and possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, the oxen were ploughing the donkeys, feeding beside them. And the, what's this word, Sabines? Sabines fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another man, no, came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And again, while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young people, and they were dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe, and shaved his head, 
and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I am from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Chapter 2, verse 6 to 10. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome swords from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which he with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not, re and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. We say amen to the reading of God's word. It's a long scripture and thankful that we follow through with it. You hear blatant evidence of trials in Job's life. Who was Job? Job was a wealthy man, blameless and upright. He was blameless and upright and he possessed a lot. <clears throat> if we was to evolve with what he had to the contents of today's day and age, Imagine you had a well-established business. Say you was the owner of Apple. You have many employees. You have many properties. Not necessarily to live in, but also to do business from. Many Apple stores are built up across the world. Many for children and blameless and upright. So you have a high standing in society. You are someone of good stature. That's the one. And always... Job was careful not to do evil. Very careful not to do evil. And then one day, as you hear, Satan comes before God. And he's, he's, he's talking with God. But at the same time, God is boasting in Job. Imagine being someone that God can boast about saying that. No matter what, this individual is upright and their faith in me will not allow them to differ or deter from it. And as you hear, Satan saying, well, if you didn't give all these blessings to him, what will he do? Then, understand, all that you heard happened, <coughs> happened in the course of one day. Not over certain years, not over one day, Bis <coughs> possessions have gone. Ten children, it was a one, two, three, four. It was ten children of his own that had passed. <clears throat> and then as you hear, he teared off his clothes in mourning. <clears throat> and then Satan appeared again. So it's not that what he'd done by removing all these what he had. He came back again to inflict diseases upon Job. Even something further. So you know when you say kick a man while he's down? So imagine you've gone through what he is, and let's not overlook what he's gone through. He's lost out on possessions of things that will cause him to eat daily. Children, ten. And then furthermore, we're going to come back and inflict law from sores upon his body. Now, at the same time, a wife is supposed to be a happy. But Job's wife was encouraging Job to turn against God. Not just his wife, but also his friends. So imagine if it's me going through a very, very, very strong, bad situation in my life, and then my wife, Colin, is telling me, listen, Mike, just curse God. And then on top of it, my brother Ishmael, JJ, devil, are turning to me and saying, Mike, man, you yourself has done something as to why this is happening to you. There's accusation. Imagine from Job's point of view. Remember, he's blameless and upright. God even mentioned that himself. This man, blameless. And then to have my old friends 
This is an example you send those who have mentioned <laughs> are convinced and informing me, as well as my wife. If you look in scripture, what a wife is to a husband. And they've all turned to tell me, well, it's got to be you. You've done something that's incurred this upon you. Now, Job was arguing back and forth, and then there was another one who involved himself in this discussion named Elihu, I believe the name is. And then for Job, Job knew where his faith was at that moment in time, regardless of what he was going through. So what is faith? Faith is something is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Another definition is having a strong belief in the doctrines of a religion based on spiritual conviction rather than proof. But if you look in 1 John 5 verse 4 about faith, it says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now I realise that Job is an extreme example of trials. Who's had trials? Job is an extreme example of trials. But he's also an extreme example of faith. The trials that Job faced was matched with the faith that Job had. His faith was deeply rooted. So it wasn't easy for him to be shaken from what he believed. What am I saying? If you have certain trials, I've had trials, you know. Even when, not even when, because it's obvious that when you come from the devil, there's an even more desire for him to come after you. So when you're not of Christ, you're already on that side, so you're not really, I need to seek somebody else. An extreme, why, when I was putting this together, I'm going to share something with you. This year, the start of this very year, you know, so I was saying from what, 2010, 2011, and my faith was shaken. Can we be honest? There's no point in, I've never drank, smoked, done drugs ever in my life, so there's no point in the devil trying to put alcohol, drugs, or anything in front of me. But when it's gone violent, he'll know what to use against me. He's got it. And I say this, God has allowed the devil to try me. How much times would you turn around and say, the devil's this, the devil that, the devil done this, but how? Scripture shows us that even God permitted the devil to try Job. So I realized that my faith wasn't even below the top soil. You understand? Thanks be to God, my wife wasn't like Job's wife. Sincerely. And something that she had in her vision was matched when Linford, George, come to her and no one discussed nothing with Linford. And from then, you know, the confirmation that Michael, he said it with himself, you can't do this anymore, Michael. Linford didn't have an idea what was going on in my life. But he says, you've got to pray it through. I'll leave it there. So now, going back to Joel, whose roots were deep in Christ, that there was three strong points that I've taken from reading the scripture that shows where Job's root came from in Christ. And if we follow those same roots that Job had, it will make us be able to overcome threats, violence, constraints, and things that is not going to make us stand in line with what Christ has called us to be. But one of the three things that we're going to look at is knowing that suffering can be good. Talking about the roots of Job's faith. Suffering can be good. Since Adam and Eve fell, since the fall of man, sickness, disease, suffering entered the world. Whether we knew that or not, it's here. We're living on a planet that since mankind fell, 
It's been cursed. And we're living in a world with cursed people at the same time as well. Now, people automatically link suffering with evil. You know? Immediately, if there's suffering, it's linked with evil. But understand that it can also be linked with good. Why am I saying this? Because Job understood this. When all the possessions of his was taken away, not once did Job say, this is pure evil. Or why is the devil doing this to me? If you can see that in scripture, please present it to me. But in fact, in, in, in his replies, it never even suggested that he saw suffering as abnormal or even satanic. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Job didn't see this as something that's not, that not normal. He realized that material and spiritual prosperity are divine gifts. And as gifts that can be given, the gifts can be taken away. So Job must have known that in his peace, self-security, prosperity and happiness, all those things can become like a distraction from continuing the strenuous journey of faith. You know like if you are very comfortable in what situation you're in, let's just take for example a competitive athlete. You say, well, everyone knows him. Say, like, he's won the last Olympics, for example. Very easily. It would be very easy for you, say, well, to then relax for the next four years or however long it is for the next Olympics to come around. Because he knows it's so good. So then his desire to train hard or even stick to strict diets and sleep and rest and just be disciplined could be lacking because it's so easy. Do you understand? But if Job can see that having taken these things away from him, then there's a continuing need to carry this journey of faith. So he believed that suffering possesses strange but beautiful power of freeing his soul from the comfort of safety and perishable goods. There was four, I spent a lot of time looking through this, and there was four things that Job saw the necessity in. One being cross-bearing. In Luke 9, verse 23, he says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. He understood the Christian necessity, necessity of persecution for righteousness' sake. Matthew 5, verse 10. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The necessity of learning obedience from hardships. That's in Hebrews 5 verse 8. He says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And the last one is the necessity of sharing in the sufferings of Christ. In Philippians 1 verse 29, it says, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Four different evidence of scripture, along with Job, that shows suffering can be good. How much time do you hear someone sick? And there's always a negative aspect of it. And you get told, don't claim it. <laughs> but who's to say that out of what you're going through, if you step away and look at the situation right there and then, there's a, there's a breakthrough in whichever situation you're going in. There's sufferings. I had to suffer. At the time, I didn't understand why I'm going through this thing. And then when you come out of it and you can look back, you see that it makes you even more continuous to carry on. If your faith is in it. You understand it? If we just suffer and then we just give up on the first count of suffering, then... What is? The next one is trust in God's providence. Trusting in his providence. The word God and providence can be used interchangeably or exchange one for another. Now people took that for granted, especially when science come into this whole Thing. I remember being in prison and there's this very man that's lived by science 
And I mean, he lived by science and he... Anything about this, the Bible, the Quran, he had an answer and evidence as to how this and the Quran is fake. Let's talk about this. He didn't match with science. So since the rise of science, we took, well, people took for granted that God rules every aspect of the universe. Especially those who believe in this big bad theory. I'm going to stay there and not say any more about that. But even in history and every detail of our personal lives, God is the one and the only one, the architect of it. Jesus said he knows the every hair on our head. Nobody, not even any surgeon or scientist can do that at the top of their head. You know when people get transplanted? And then people kind of, I was watching Wayne Rooney's one. And the, <laughs> and the surgeon was to say, well, we're just going to take a, a, a substantial amount of hair. They're going to give detail. Not that they have to. But you know, if, imagine God was standing beside him. I'm just whispered. There's 69 billion hundred amounts of hair that are going to be moved off the back. Jesus said, God knows the, the very numbers. Understand that compared to science. But since the rise of science, it seems that God can be credited or even blamed for both personal <laughs> calamities and catastrophes. He's very quick to blame God. Notice that it's all science. But when it goes bad, God. And then there comes an argument about if it's real, and so on and so forth. But why is it more historical and scientific to, to reason that if God is all loving, he was ever had a decent encounter with somebody that? <laughs> you see where he's going? If God is all loving, then the existence of suffering tells us that can't be all real, is it? Why are people dying? <coughs> why are we suffering? Why do we endure this whole mood of sadness or this negativity? You hear this in conversation, maybe you haven't. But you hear this, well, I used to hear it quite often. Then it can't be all powerful. And if God is all powerful, why are such afflictions existing in this world today? You ever encountered such discussions? And if He's not all loving, then is there really a God? If He is not all loving, because you. To, to, if you love somebody, you wouldn't allow certain things to happen. Why are people getting killed across the world? Why are babies, and everyone runs to the baby <coughs> who's killed during the wars and so forth. It's all right if they're older, but they signify if it's a baby. We know when people were trying to cross the borders, they didn't really take too much count upon the dead bodies, but when there was a baby seen floating on the sea, how much newspaper articles, radios, and TVs did you see that image portrayed over? And then these questions arise, how can God allow this to happen? But understand, omnipotent God. Are we aware of that? If someone's got that view to question God upon those same things, then they can't in any way contain the elements of divine love. And this is the message of our faith. Our faith is divine love. At the centre of the gospel, like I said, is God's omnipotent love. It's all-powerful love in human form. Evident on the cross. That was pure God love in human form upon the cross. And I speak for myself. He knew back then, when he was nailed on the cross and died there, that someone like me... You know? <sighs> My background was was wild. Mm. When he died on the cross, he knew hmm. that someone like me, Michael Harris, pure evil, you know. 
wickedness to people. Fooled by streets. You know? But God knew this, that, that love there for years to come. Not just for me, for you. But I speak for myself. Even in the midst of what we was doing. He still saw me and said, I've done it for you. You know? That love, that on the cross, hmm, suffered. You know that suffering for somebody that don't even know you? Suffering for somebody that didn't even want to accept you for years. Growing up in the church, still didn't accept you. And ran around and swore that if I see anybody from a different neighborhood, I'm going to, you know? Because if it was a case of you weren't doing what they call putting in work, which was to be front lining. Your own people will start pushing it on you. What I'm saying, so if you're just seeing from the area and you ain't doing nothing, you'll become victim. You know, people start praying on you, start questioning what you're doing. You know, especially when shootings would happen. Where was you? And if you ain't got a good enough answer, I'm being honest with you, people try you, you know? Where was you when this happened? And you don't bother tell me that it was just, just don't say nothing that, well, this is how stingy and wicked the world is out there. If you have no knowledge of it. You understand? Some people, you could see within them that they're not even cut out. And they're not, it's not there for their mum or dad's from Aston. But because of that, and your post when you let us come through, means that you have to represent. But going back to the cross, God knew that this day right now, I'll be here doing this. Another one where people come with that mindset is, if you have that same view, assuming that if suffering appears to be pointless, then it must be pointless. It shows arrogance and ignorance. Like I said, if we know that suffering from our previous experience and the benefits that we've come out from it, and we still assume that it's pointless, that's just purely down to our limited mind that can't even grasp the depth, you know, that, 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 that God has shown his love through us, or shown his love to us, and then, they, and then if we have to suffer, then we'll suffer. This is the people that don't believe it. It's just suffering, then we suffer, and then we die. And then the, God whole, the whole God topic is, 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 is closed. And there's no getting them. You know, there's people that have... I used to, in Lazar's world, we, we you used to have the, the people like myself. I say myself now, but you see before, when people try and talk to me about God, keep it moving. You understand? God was still out there, whether we want to accept it or not. And sometimes it can be in your face. And just because you're ignorant, you would refuse and deny him. Job had no idea what was going on when, 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 when the devil approached God. Job didn't have no flying the wall experience to hear that this was coming upon him. Job was just Job. While that discussion was happening, Job was going about his everyday life. And then all of a sudden, it just got taken away. But understand, his faith... Didn't, didn't move from God. And Job, Job was more or less like you hear about the potter and the clay. You could say that Job was like the clay. God being the potter. And as you hear in these many sermons, the clay gets broken, battered and start over again and things like such. Job never once turned around to God and said, do you know what you're doing as the potter? But he allowed trust. <laughs> He allowed trust, faith, that I understand, I know I'll be molded correct. No question about it. Job's faith was like, totally sure in Christ that God will come through with him. And that's evident that he trusted in the purposeful providence of God, the faith that God had. Another thing is believing in the resurrection. Resurrection is a powerful part of faith. Now, when I was reading, I'm going to read over, read over, read over. 
it doesn't show that he believed in life after death. Because in the times that he was living, wrongs would be judged and made right. But Job speaks with his friends. And while he's speaking with them, it was apparent that he believed in the bodily resurrection at that specific time. The bodily resurrection. In Job 19 verses 25 to 26, he was answering his friends with accusations because remember they were saying things about he called, he, he sinned, hence why all these things that happened to him. But in the scripture he says, for I know that my Redeemer lives. He knows his Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Hello. Job held the belief that there would be a resurrection and that in that day there also would be retribution. You know, Job, confidence. We heard confidence spoken a couple of sermons ago. When you have confidence, do you know that there's nothing much that could make you move so easily other than that? You know, this, the floor that this chairs you sit on, the floor that you stand on, there's nothing more. There's a confidence that when you sit down, the chair's going to bear your weight. You don't even second guess it when you sit down. When you stand up, you don't second guess the ground that you're standing on. You're confident. You have trust and faith in the ground that's going to hold you. So if someone's going to tell you, be careful how you stand up, you know, that's going to make way for a big hole. You laugh. <laughs> because you're confident that you'll stand. This was like Job. He looked towards the afterlife. And I took that part and I thought about us in this life now. A lot of people can't live in accordance with the afterlife. So you're outside of Christ. And when you're saved, it's like, this is it here. And then we want to stay with this position here. But there's a tr it's like a transition. Don't strive for here. Don't strive for here. The resurrection in the afterlife is a target of ours as believers. Do you understand? And when we, when, we, when, we, when we go through certain things, myself, I'm speaking for myself especially, there's a reminder, it's like, this isn't it, you know. This isn't it here. What you're enduring here is just trials, it's just tests. I don't know the song, but you know when they say, nobody told me that the road would be easy. And then the first, not the first, but there's times when you see some serious trials. A lot of people jump back to where they started from. Because I can't see the afterlife. Myself, especially at the start of this year, like I told you, I was, uh, you know, but it was like God remind, just reminded me, bring it back to scripture, sorry. Understanding that we've got to endure things here to look towards the afterlife. And if we can understand what the afterlife reward is through the resurrection, it will make bearing this as we're here more pleasurable, if that makes sense. If you knew what your reward was, it will make it worth it what you're going through on here. You know that our testimonies aren't just for us to hold on to, because it can bring someone else through something. And not everyone's testimony has to be this big, you know, I understand, my sister was telling me, because a lot of times I get asked to share my testimony at places, to that point where I start to think, why is it that they want to hear all these kind of testimonies and not just a normal testimony? When I say normal, I mean like something that's not so heavy. I don't know how to word that, you know. And my sister was saying to me, it's a time of now. You know, there's a time of now. Reverend, knows, I was asked to go to um, Church of God of in Aberdeen Street. And they had this um, prison ministry service going on. And when I was asked to go there, immediately I said yes. And I've gone down there. And before we went in there, me and we was praying in the car. 
Because that's the area that I would never be in. You understand? And when I was sharing, I could see mothers could be late. And this woman followed me as I went out to the bathroom. And she says to me, my son's in prison for gun crime. And she said, there's something about the world today that needs to hear your message. She's like a revelation because at times I feel like, this just leave the testimony and just try and hear a word, but then I, it was like evident, no, it helps people yes. through. Because everyone's got trials going on. And unfortunately for a lot of generation my age and younger, or it's either prison or, 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 or death. So then I, 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 I take it as the trials that I go through, even to this year, and having come through. Now that is all over, because God, God is the one who, who knows. But it does make it more enjoyable, seeking, knowing that where God has taken me from, and you've got to endure this period here before the afterlife. Job understood the need for the resurrection. <coughs> And the remedy to this is in Joel, in Romans 8, verse 18. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us. That was the confirmation whilst I was studying. For I consider that the sufferings, this is Paul's words, I consider that the sufferings at this present time they're not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Every one of us, remember these three roots of the faith. First one, first one, as you remember, knowing that suffering can be good. The second one was trusting in the providence of God. And the third one was believing in the resurrection. Entwine all three. Your faith should be strong. You know, even as times if you are not involved in anything, just see the relationship that you and God started off with. I have to remind myself every day, and I remember the promise that I made after God says to me, it's pure in, in, in scripture. It says, surrender all and I will give you all. That was something that was evident from the start. God even echoed it to me weeks after when I just got saved. And it's like, if we, if, we, if, we, if we have belief in the resurrection, if we trust in the providence of God, and if we know that suffering is good, what could really deter us so easy, should I say? You know, as well as us really remembering our own personal situation where we once was, to where we are now. Not always looking for blessings and gifts and everything that comes upon us that makes us happy. But also in the times of suffering, that's a major one. And then God himself answered Job in all what was going on when he was seen with his friends. And God speaks to Job and he challenges Job's understanding by reminding him of his wisdom, sovereignty and his power. And if we hold on to our faith in God, we too can be restored from our own trials, just like Job was. If we sincerely do, we too can be restored. Remember, Job was humble. Job was blameless. Job was upright. And yet, all that you've seen happen to him, it can happen to us. If we are blameless and if we are upright, the same as Job, it can happen to us. And if we are not blameless and we are not upright, then it still can happen to us. <coughs> scripture has it, and Job's not the only one that suffered in Scripture. But their faith remains. How is our faith? In the year of faith that we are proclaiming, before we push it out there, how is our own faith? Because if we're trying to, trying to entice and encourage people to come, and our own faith is kind of wobbling, what, what, what can we really present to those who's seeking? Do you understand? It's very easy for us to do this every week. And I could be standing up here, but my faith is wobbled. And I'm in just unsure now, but yeah, I'm trust, still trying to tell people to come. How does it look? 
But Job can't see that God's will is unstoppable. And he repents. And God reminds Job, the way he reminds his friends about the misrepresentation of Job. And when he restores Job, <laughs> he becomes twice as wealthy. And he's blessed with children. Remember he lost ten children in one day. And God blessed him with children, you know? And then God will restore. God will restore. You know, it's happened with Job. And we see in our flesh today. How is the faith? If our faith is sincere, God will restore. And throughout the book of Job, we wonder whether Job will stand firm with, with his faith. And I will inform you that he did remain faithful to God, whilst God remained faithful to Job. It was a two-way. God remained faithful to Job, knowing Job will remain faithful to God. These are my words. I hope it has touched somebody and given someone another light of encouragement. And before we close, I'll take this opportunity if anyone wants to be prayed for, whichever faith is wobbled, if anybody is feeling any way outside of the what God has called them to be, the floor is open. Now, I'm not one that drags out altar calls or waits for somebody to move before somebody else moves. But whoever needs to come, it's a moment. If anybody wants to raise a sign, I can't see. <laughs> I just can't keep.